Even though this life gets tough, said you gotta keep fighting. fighting. And even though it gets hard, it's gonna get you hard. You gotta keep striving. But you gotta keep striving. Through the fears and the loss, the, the tears won't turn off. The tears no won't tears turn your heart's crying. Yes, Hold on to his words. Hold me on him. It gets better by the night. The toughest war you ever face will be domestic. It's elementary, it's been this way for centuries. Co workers raised against, against us. Take see. off the blindness, you will see. You'll see. That it ain't about them gas prices, it's all about who whip the nicest. Hard about them deals on bundles, hair on fleet, don't make them up. Face beating red bottoms, dead beats, we hear about them. Fit it up from here to toe, but never at their children's door. Wonder why they dying by the dozens, but it's simple, yo. Just listen. It's time we stop ignoring facts. It's time we take our family back. Fix the root and dinner attack. Stop making moves without a plan. Control emotions, then we stand. Calling on my kingdom in to come together. Take this land. We gotta fight our future depends. Get the head back in order, cause that's where it begins. Invest your all into your garden, water the roots to the end. Nurture the family tree and let the food feed all men. Just let's this life. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of A Mile in My Shoes, where we ask the question, how can we say we know someone if we've never heard this story? So, we got a very, very, very special guest coming on tonight, somebody that is extremely dear to me, and if you know me, and you know a little bit about my story, then I guarantee you've heard this woman's name a couple of times. Uh, she has journeyed uh, across the states uh, in obedience to God and pouring into children of God for years and years and years. And we're going to hear some of this story. Not only that, we're going we gonna to get on to the topic of how can we reach the youth of today? So without any further ado, I want y'all to welcome Mrs. Beth Gidry who I call Mom Beth. Oh! <laughs> What's going on, Mom Beth? Youngin. Man, this is nerve-wracking. What in the world? How did who knew <laughs> hanging out with you be so stressful? <laughs> Look, how, how are you doing? First first of all, it's just good to see anytime I get a chance to, to link up. <laughs> it's been some years. It's, some, it's been Whoa. a long it's been a long journey and some years. <laughs> to say so, the least. We're going to get into some <clears throat> good topics. Look, I got my imaginary popcorn. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Before we get into the obedience, the, 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 the youth, tell us a little bit about you, uh, your meeting God, and, 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 and a little bit about that journey. Well, I guess I'm the kid that that probably should have been medicated young. I'm glad my mother didn't kill me. I mean, animals eat their young and now I know why. My mama probably should have ate me a long time ago, but it's a good thing she didn't because I've been taking care of her the last two years. Yes, Lord. <laughs> so, um, yeah, which I have a son that's just like that. I, I almost ate him when he was little because, Lord. Which but, one are you talking I know, I know you're not saying Jared doesn't come to mind. Little oh, Jared no. doesn't come to mind at all. You don't, know. Do my little, don't do my little brother like that. Listen, listen, li Linda, Linda, listen. Listen, there was a purpose. The Lord used me. I clung to the Lord's garment. I was the wretch in the song and clung to his garment because little Jared wouldn't have made it. He wouldn't have. And, Look, and I, was, I didn't know what everybody was complaining about. I had Megan. Megan was the greatest thing since sliced bread. She's the reason I'm saved today, you know. And everybody, now I know what everybody's talking about. They were like, oh, these children today. I'm like, what are y'all talking about? Like, Megan is like the greatest. And my mama said, don't you have no more. Don't have no more. They don't make them like that. You know how much we listen to our parents. I'm like, shh. Now I know why. <laughs> now, how, how did you say you said Megan was the one that saved you. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. How did that happen? Okay, so um, I was married. I was in the Air Force. Uh, got married young, homesick, 
lost my grand uh, lost my grandmother. She was the first closest person to me. Went back to California. Was homesick so bad. Um, I, I knew a guy in the Air Force, and anyway, we connected. And six months later, I'm married. <laughs> homesick. Grabbed the first thing. It was him. It was God ordained because I would do it again a hundred times to get Megan. Um, she's the best part of both of us, which if you, anybody has kids, they know, you know, which even the good parts of Jared, I know where it came from. Hello. I know. Mm -hmm. So, um, Megan, um, I was living in New Orleans, you know, I got remarried, divorced, remarried. Um, and, um, she started going to church with a neighbor, a friend of ours. Um, we were living at my grandmother's. I was helping her out and, um, long story. But um, she started going to church with a neighbor and she would get up like really early in the morning on a Sunday and she was school age. So it's like, you know, something's up with this. They must be feeding him donuts or something. Anyway, uh, she she was a Sunday school teacher, so she would get, take her to church. And it was First Baptist Church in New Orleans. And Megan loved it. And she kept saying to me, now, my husband at the time was in the oil field. So when he's gone, it's like everything's on me. You know, you got two small kids. Little Jared was six months old at the time. We're living in my grandmother's. God bless the people. And um, so every time she would ask me to go to church with her, um, she'd say, Mom, you got to come to church with me. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did the church thing. I had an aunt that was a holy roller, you know, full of the Holy Ghost, scared everybody in the family, you know, would prophesy over them and everybody would run when she would come. But it was legit. Now that I know. My prayer was, Lord, I want to know Jesus like she knows him. I just don't want it to look that crazy. <laughs> but when you're that sold out, you don't really care how crazy it looks. <laughs> so anyway, so, um, yeah, she was spirit filled, loved going to church with her. I loved just when they sang, just this, the sweet feeling in the church. So I had a taste of what the atmosphere of God felt like, not church, but atmosphere of God. So. Of course, Megan kept bothering me. And I told my husband at the time, I'm like, listen, the next time Megan asks us to go to church, you're going to be here next Sunday. We're going. Because yeah. that way, the weekend after that, when you're gone, I'll say, hey, remember, I went to church with you that last week. Remember? So I had a whole plan. Had a whole plan, man. I knew we going to church. Megan asked, and I'm like, oh, so dad's in. Yes, let's go. All the things. We go. And the Lord met us at the front door. Mm. Knew exactly who to, who to, you know, connect us with young people that had kids just like us and they were cool they weren't crazy you know prophesying over the people they were just so cool to hang out with so of course we went the next week and we started hanging out with them and learning I started listening to Joyce Meyer Jesse Duplantis all the things bought the bible with the bumper sticker and the zip case and everything to put the all the things look listen listen the Lord knew what he was doing because I was a hot mess. I'd still be dancing on tables if it wasn't for my child. Seriously. Funny how them children just, seems. Uh, man, let me see. She was, she was always wise. Always, always wise. I don't, I never understood it, but it's like the Lord knows how to, you know, just meet you where you're at. And to this day, I'm actually living with her now. Her and her husband are youth pastors here in Tulsa. Mm. And, um, Fulfilling dreams I never even knew to dream. And um, I get to be here and help them because when I was in the church, I saw a lot of the, uh, which we'll get into, a lot of the pastor's kids, you know, they're pulled in a hundred directions. Well, then the kids, they, I mean, they get tagged a lot. I mean, you know, they go to the classes and all the things, but um, it just, it was different, you know, so I didn't want my kids kids, my grandkids to fall between the cracks while they're chasing this generation. Yeah. You know, I just was like, not my watch. That wasn't a thing that I prayed, but I just didn't want it to happen. And when they became youth pastors and the Lord said I could go, I was like, what? So, yeah. but, um, but yeah, so when I started growing in the Lord, basically we were living in New Orleans and uh, my husband at the time got transferred to Lafayette. And me and Megan looked at each other and we were like, when we get there, we're going to find a church, a church that we can grow in. Because we were the only ones like actively going. Yeah. Jared, little Jared was a baby. He didn't have a choice. So he just, you know, and big Jared was gone a lot. He was in the oil field. So he was gone a lot. So um, 
actually Jesse Duplantis visited a church in Lafayette not too long after we got there. Mm -hmm. And it was the first church we wound up going to. So we knew if he was there, that's where we wanted to go. So yeah. sure enough, it was spirit filled and all the things. And I got plugged in not too long after that. But the way I got plugged in is Megan would always want to go to missionettes on Wednesdays. And listen, when your husband's in the oil field, you're a single parent a lot of times. Yeah. And yeah. so, well, Megan kept coming home on Wednesdays going, and I'd sit in the sanctuary, but she'd go, we don't have a teacher. We can't keep a teacher around. We can't. Was a good thing the Lord didn't tell me why they couldn't keep a teacher around. It's because it was all the pastor's kids in the class. Hello. Rough. Hello. Well, good thing I wasn't raised in church because I didn't know any better. So she was like, Mom, you could do it. I mean, they give you a piece of paper that has the scripture on it and the Bible story. You just have to read it. And I'm like, I can do that. I'm saved enough to do that. You know, I'm still growing in the Lord. You know, I don't know, in, you know, anything. But I mean, they're 11. How dangerous could they be? So good thing I didn't know. Because I, <laughs> I said, yes. Yes, I can read the paper. Yes, we can act Look, out the thing. You're going to learn today. And they're girls. They're just girls. Mm. It's a good thing the Lord does. <laughs> but I cherish that time now because I look back and I look at where these young people are now. You know, the ones that I had to pop a knot in. You know, you must have been one of them too because I, I came chasing after you too. It was like, listen, all the young people that he had my heart attached to, they have a call on them and for whatever reason they need a Miss Beth chasing them. <laughs> For whatever reason, just for a little pause, if 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 you, if you, if you do not know, and, and and I love that part when it says it, it takes a village to raise a child. It does, uh, because a lot of times when children go through difficulties, their parents can't reach them. That's just how it's made. Yeah, that's just how it's made because it's so close to home yeah. that it, it you can't reach them. But when whenever I was going, wait, wait, wait. You were the book lady at Super. No, North. card. Card. I was doing greeting cards because greeting my cards. kids, because I was driving a 15 passenger van as my personal vehicle and to put gas in it so we could go across town to go to church. I, I literally was doing greeting cards because I could do it on my own time they while the kids were at school. Oh my goodness. So I'm like, one day, this, you came up to me and I'm like, you're young. And I'm like, you know, and you look like your daddy. You don't look like me. And you come up to me and you ask me something about the Lord. And I looked at you like, how are you going to roll up on somebody and ask them something about God? Like, like how did you know you could come ask me that? Because it was something deep. I don't remember what it was, but it was like, I was like, how are you going to come at me like that? And I'm like, I answered you honestly, but I was like, how did you know? And you said, the Lord told me. And I was like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm still trying to learn to hear from the Lord myself. I'm like, well, I wish he talked to me like that out loud, you know, like, right, right, right. So I was learning my whole process of learning to hear from the Lord because I read scripture and all that. And when people would say, I heard from the Lord, how you heard from the I ain't never heard him speak. Never, never. But one thing, when I did learn what he sounds like, what he looks like here on earth, that's what I wanted to share with all you guys. Because I saw, if I didn't know it, I know there's other people didn't know. Yeah. Going to church, taking notes, all the things. So listening to the sermon series and taking notes, I learned his character. Mm. I learned the character of God. So I knew that was the framework in which he was trying to conform me. Because you know I'm out the box. Bless his heart, he's got his hands full. Good thing he's got the Holy Spirit working with him. And... um. <laughs> You know, he, he does. He uses. So the reason I really jumped in and felt like I could work in children's ministry and do anything because that Bible story where the donkey, he used the donkey. I don't remember the whole Bible story, except that he used the donkey. And <laughs> and I'm like, well, if he used a donkey, I don't care what my ex-husband says. I am not that stubborn. I know he can use me. I know he can use me. I know he can. He created me. I know he can use me. Especially since I'm, I'm asking him to use me. Right. So yeah. Well, hmm, we'll just be careful when you ask the Lord. <laughs> and and how many years would you say it's been now? You just working and and and, and pouring into to, to kids' lives. Well, Megan was Megan was six and she's thirty three now. So 
I can't. I'm not good at math. It's a whole lot. <laughs> so, see, and, but but at the time when I signed up, I didn't sign up to pour into kids. Like that's the thing about God. He gives you, you know, he's like we do this prosperity gospel where he gives you the desires of your heart because you want a Mercedes and all that. No, no, no. That is well. I mean, maybe he does that for you, but not for me. He gives. I've always wanted to foster kids because I always felt I was loved so well. And I told my mom that that I said, y'all did y'all love me? My step parents. I always loved all my step parents. I have step brothers and sisters, half brothers and sisters. Um, that I just felt family was good, you know. But not. I found out later that not everybody has that. Not everybody tastes of that. Yeah. You know. And once I started growing as a a Christian, I realized if you hadn't even tasted a family, why would you sign up to be part of a family? that's kind of like eh. and my fathers weren't perfect I had a stepfather and a real father and I mean they they loved me the best they were capable but uh let's just say I had lots of daddy issues you know my real father just didn't know how to plug in with me uh he was more of a you know put your hands to the grind kind of thing and yeah you know so I, I would go fishing with him you know at eight um he's like put your boat in the middle of the bayou and I'm like I'm eight I don't okay you know, so that's the kind of relationship we had. Well, come to find out, that's his relationship he had with his parents. You know, it was like what you didn't do or what you, you know. And I'm sure he was like me, probably should have been medicated, you know. But um, we weren't, so <laughs> you get what you get. But, um, you know, the, the daddy abandonment issue makes it hard. Women are more likely to follow God. Anyway, I think it's harder for men, especially if you didn't have a father that was very nurturing. Mm -hmm. And the generation before us was a hard generation. You know, yeah. we don't do emotions. We don't do. They all went to war, came back, didn't talk about it. You know, like all the things. Yeah. So even if you didn't go to war, you were raised by the generation that went to war and you worked hard and you got out there and you just you didn't. It yeah. was required, yeah. you know. And that's another thing I've learned. The generations are changing, mm. but the principles still stay the same. He still requires us to be part of it, like put our hands in the mix, you know, put our feet on the ground, like boots on the ground. We can't just talk the talk. We got to get in the trenches. And that looks different for every generation. The, yeah. the trenches, getting in the trenches these days looks nothing like back in the day. So, you know, what, what are the, before we even get into that, I watched you. How did you have the ability, ability to to grab on to these children and like love them the way you did? Like, I I, I don't know I don't know how to put it into words because I I I watched it. It's almost like you really mothered children that were not yours, and I I'm not talking about like pick them up and take them, go get something to eat every now and then. <laughs> or, no, like you really like phone calls, come knock on your door, pick you up. If, if Are you if where we, you're not supposed to be? Because I'm showing up. Like. And so that's my accident. I'm like. <laughs> ex explain that. How do you, how do you see? And this that? is the thing. When I, when I got saved. My prayer was, and again, be careful what you pray. You know, the, ho the whole worship thing, send me, I'll go. So, you know, we just be getting, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Man, be careful. If you mean that stuff, he's going to take you to, listen, you're going to get sent. Listen. So, send me. I, well, he, he did. And my prayer was, Lord, if you send me, you give me an instruction, whatever it is, if it's meant for me and I need to do it, do not let it leave my mind. So, mm. Which, which that was me learning how the Lord speaks to me. So I love doing things for people, but I've learned the more mature I get in Christ that just because I can do it doesn't mean it's meant for me to do because he has things for other people to do. Jesus didn't pray for every sick person. He prayed for the ones his father told him to pray for. I think he was on assignment. Yeah. So... You know, because I think he passed 
a bunch of lepers before he would pray for a specific, you know, so I needed to get wisdom just because I could do it. Didn't mean I was supposed to do it. I needed to wait for instruction. Mm. So like, for instance, things that I've done for you, God would lay something on my heart and it was like a dog with a bone, which is what I wanted because I have ADHD and I could be over here and in 10 seconds later be way in a different room doing something totally different. But I wanted to be focused and intentional about what the Lord has in every season. Yeah. So, you know, the love he has is real. When he ties you to a place, one thing I learned is when you're supposed to be somewhere, your heart is tied there like Mm. with a bow. Okay. And we know what home feels like. Yeah. You know, and if you don't know what home is, you know, he'll show you what it feels like to be home and to be accepted and be celebrated without strings attached. So once you learn, you put that in your knower. OK, so I know what home feels like, because then when transition comes, because you are only supposed to have some people in your life for a season, Ooh. you're only supposed to be in certain places for a season. So understanding what is not them attacking you. It's just you transitioning seasons. It's not always the devil. It's hold up, hold up, break uh, that. Hold up, hold up, hold up. <laughs> we we hold up, hold up. It's a teaching moment. It's a teaching moment. Break that down because that is that is a is a we give the devil too thing. way too much credit. He gets way too much credit. That's a major thing that many people don't understand. Something the spirit of offense because. Forever. People come at us crossways. A lot of times it's God shutting the door. It really isn't. That person is just, they're, God's using them, whatever the case may be. And a season is closing. But if he didn't untie your heart, you would never move. Mm. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. I mean, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Mm. If it always felt like home, who wants to leave? Nobody. I'm thinking back on so many situations where he had to rock because I couldn't let it go. You were like, this is the enemy. This is the enemy coming against us. Like, no. The Lord's like, oh, my God. If you don't get over here, I'm trying to turn you right. And you way over here stuck in the corner crying because, you know, this, this bosses is come cool. against us, oh. all the things. And we just we just determined to keep our feet. And that's and we're not moving by the grace of God. No, he's. Let's go, people. Let's move it. Let's move it. Don't look to the left. <laughs> if he didn't untie your heart, you would never move. Ooh, but if you don't just... learn that, then you get all offended. You know, and it's like, oh, Lord. you know, um, and again, so let's just say when I got divorced, right? Okay. Me and my husband were on two different pages. Um, how can I say this? I cert by teaching a class, I literally was learning. God knew by teaching, I would learn because I'm not going to get up there and tell you anything I don't know about. And a good pastor usually is living out whatever the sermon is. God deals with it in him first. And then, you know, he shares it with the body and so on and so forth. So um, I found that that's what I did by teaching. I taught the class between where they're, prepubescent into youth you know because I felt like that's an awkward age and I love that I love the misfits I love the the castaways the ones that go against the grain I'm like oh the ones that cuss at you like yes you need to cut out with me yes look bring you it know <laughs> so um, that, that's just always been my heart so when I got divorced we were just heading in two different directions and it got physical I, I would get so frustrated Cause you know, at the time my daughter went to master's commission at 17 and I was like, what Lord, what you, so I gave birth to her. She prayed me in, thank God. And then now at 17, I have to let her go live in another state. You gotta be kidding me. She graduated at 17, very responsible. Still didn't want to let her go. I'm like, that's my baby. Like what? Live in Atlanta at that. Let your child at 17, Drive their car and be responsible. Oh, yes, the Lord said, let her go. Let her go. I'm like, oh, I can't stand you. I can't stand you. Listen, I, the ugly cry, like, why are you so mean, Lord? Why? And he's like, I put my son on the cross for you. How are you going to tell me you can't let your son go, your daughter go to Atlanta? Like, the Lord right speaks to quick. me like that, right? <laughs> 
He's like, oh, I put my son on a cross so you could even come to me. And you talk, she just going to Atlanta to serve me. Hello. She's not going to be a drug addict. She's going to serve to learn to be a servant. Yeah. Okay, Lord. <laughs> All the things. Yeah. All the things. <laughs> I know. Look, that, that, was, that must have been a hard lesson in obedience. You it was. Learn. It was. It was hard. Because he told me, he said, she don't, she don't belong to you anyway. Who do you think gave you her? You know, he gets all in my face. I know the Lord don't talk to y'all that way. But he knows he has to talk to me that way. Because, you know, I just, you know, I'm just like him. I'm like, don't talk to me that way. And he's like, I brought you in the world. I can take you out. <laughs> and look, she does talk to us that way. If she does. <laughs> I'm going to go. Listen, I, didn't, I wasn't. Look, I wasn't raised in the church. I didn't know you were supposed to talk to people crazy. Look. I'm like. That's why all that's why all the rough ones can come to you. You you know how to get yeah yeah. That's a, that's another show. That's another show. Uh, yeah, that is another show. Yeah, I love when they created Medea. I'm like, oh look, I'm finally on screen. Yes, praise the Lord. Peace be still. My, my, I love it. Now let's let's get into this topic with the youth because this is. <laughs> This is this is a rough one, and, and a lot of people feel like the the body of Christ is kind of losing their reach on the, on the youth. What are the, the the major differences you see from youth back then to youth now? Okay, so my daughter and son in law are youth pastors here, so I have an upfront seat into just the everyday. I mean, not even low income, like that's a whole nother level of, you know, just re regular average American. I told um, Brandon earlier that, uh, you know, just we're only in what the beginning of April. I can't tell you how many times that my son, son in law has been to the hospital because the kids tried to commit suicide or, you know, just done something dumb that could take their life, like, it, you know, whether it was suicide or something else. And I told him, I said, the difference is they live, because my kids were raised when cell phones just came out. Megan got, like, the first flip phone, the Nokia, whatever. The Razor. You know, but she, but she, the Razor, yes, yeah, that's what it was. So, but she was very responsible. I got a BlackBerry. I'm like, I'm not, mm -mm, BlackBerry. So, um, but she was always responsible. So, you know, but then Lil Jared came along and they were gamers. And I noticed that they would, you know, that would be their escape. Not that they needed to escape, but they did. They would, they loved competing. They loved all the things and they would for hours. And then I'd have to on purpose, you know, create things, invite y'all over, go get all y'all to get my kids off the TV. <laughs> we, you know, go do something. So, but um, I could see this generation is so focused on electronics that that di that um, virtual world is really more real to them than the real world. One is social media. Everybody's highlights are on their social media, you know. Um, so, of course, you're you're looking at somebody's social media, or the highlights of their life, not the lows, you know, not the highs. Even if you look on mine, I, I, I do share when I have a hard day. You know, to let people know that if you're having a hard day, it's okay. It's it's okay. It's what you do during the hard day. But a lot of times, people when they're having tragedy or loss or just that feeling of not something's not right in this season. You know, you don't know how to express it. You don't know who to go to. Um, you don't know how to process it. You know, a lot of people go through that a lot. You know, especially young people because there's so much in their life that they don't understand because their brains aren't finished developing. You know, they think they know everything, but they really don't, you know, and you can't even explain that to them because they think they've grown. And, you know, we know we screwed the country up. We know that we need you to mature and get some discipline and come fix it. So, that's how, yeah, that's, that's how my story. At. So, yeah, I'm like, well, dude, why don't you do something about it then instead of just going get on the computer? So anyway, but that's um, so it's different because I got in the trenches with y'all just by accident just because I wanted to hang out and be cool with y'all but it's like there would be moments where I knew I had to speak and I would use the time um to just teach one lesson like when cadre we created the cadre group it's oh. just the boys 
Okay, so that was me. Okay, Megan was in master's commission, and I would visit her. And she, um, Jeannie Mayo actually is who Megan sat under. Mm-hmm. And Jeannie Mayo has pastors from around the country. They're, her, they're in a cadre group. So she, they fly out to visit her once or twice a year, and she just pours into them. It's a place where pastors can go, youth pastors, children's pastors, whoever can go. They're loved, accepted. They can de-stress. They can get out their frustrations, but get wisdom, no judgment. Because mm. a lot of times if you're in the church on church staff, you can't go to your boss, the, you know, because it's like you can't really tell how you feel because a lot of times it could be with them. Yeah. You know, it just, it, it, we're all human and it's, just yeah so um that's a place where they can go and that's what i wanted to be i always wanted to be a place of non-judgment because lord if i had my ducks in a row it'd probably be different but my my ducks are never in a row so i'm never judging i'm never judging anybody yeah because i never had it together i never felt like i had it together i'm like uh if it's even barely together that's the lord's doing my kids turned out great because of the lord not because of me not because of me megan raised us the best she could <laughs> me and the two boys <laughs> and she's got three brothers on her daddy's side lord knows she tried that's you know but um basically it was learning how to hear him and then learning um my mission and i had somebody i read a prophecy one time i knew it was for me i mean my stomach leapt and i just want to share it with because it'll give you a glimpse of We usually know who we are, but we don't know that we know who we are. So, Mm -hmm. for instance, I read this back in 2004, and it says it's called um, the apostolic generation emerges, the treasure hunters. Now, listen, I didn't know what apostolic meant. I didn't know what none of that. You know, my crazy aunt that I talked to you about, the Holy Roller, she always prophesied over me and talked about stuff. I'm like, I don't know what she's talking about half the time. I know she loves Jesus. I love she was a worshiper. So she worshiped and tongues and with the flags and all of that. Do you know what she's close to Jesus? I just do you know when I met her, that was like the (laughs) the first time like I kind of understood where I was going with it. And I didn't feel strength. What I what I yeah. She was but but I understand she was talking at such a level that I wasn't there (laughs) yet. (laughs) You know she's a like my elevator hadn't gotten that close to Jesus, you know. Um, but when she started speaking, but I knew this word was for me. And after years of speaking with her, now some of that stuff started lining up. It started making sense. And it says an apostolic generation emerges. We will see in them a people who are driven to recover and release the destinies of others. They will look past obvious weaknesses and those that they discover to find priceless treasures. The apostolic man or woman tirelessly searches through the refuse of the devil to discover those the enemy has abused and entangled in sin, and those hidden treasures are awaiting him. He possesses the heart and mind of Christ and views people through the eyes of redemption. He is a treasure hunter and views the world quite differently than most. He does not look for treasure in storehouses or palaces, but in those who have been discarded and abandoned by the enemy. True treasure hunters, and the hunter's eyes is what that which, let's say, uh, true treasure in the hunter's eyes is left undiscovered in forgotten fields where the unkempt grass has grown and masks the treasures hidden in it. Others who were more concerned with getting to their destination than helping their brothers have passed by this forgotten field without giving it a second chance. Those who passed by inevitably inevitably missed some of the greatest treasures God could have bestowed upon the body of Christ. Seeking to become the embodiment of Christ, the treasure hunter looks for the great among the lowly and the meek. It is in the greatness of Christ in the treasure hunter that enables him to recognize the greatness in others. With patience unmatched, he listens to one heart-wrenching story of neglect and abuse after another, each more disparaging than the last. With the precision of a diamond cutter, He dissolves the wounds of the past with the compassion of the cross. One after another, these forgotten treasures are restored, given dignity and in the position of the family of God. The treasure hunters esteem for them, gives them a sense of value that they have not known before. 
these forgotten treasures are now able through the esteem of the treasure hunter to receive the love and forgiveness of a heavenly father they had not known. And thus they, they gladly become loyal servants. And it says through the gift of appreciation, the treasure hunter has revealed their value. Now others who before him did not understand. It says, um, a deeper look into the treasure hunter shows us he surrounded himself with the treasures that others have deemed unworthy. Yet these unworthy broken people have banded together under the guidance of the treasure hunter to form a powerful army with the fright, with a frightful sight, the forgotten treasures have suddenly become an army, an army to the enemy. Those he had beaten and abused, those he had thrown out and threatened with contempt have come back to haunt him. Satan sees before him an unstoppable force. Mm. Now on. he sees them. Now then he sees them standing before him, bold and start hearted, heartedly, undergirded by the evaluation of the treasure hunter and the love of heaven. This army is consumed by their goal to alight upon their enemy and dismantle the kingdoms of darkness to retrieve those caught in Satan's web of delusion. Little does he know the enemy has actually trained them. Satan knows that these enemy seeking warriors are not naive as they once were, but now know how he operates. They have learned a lot from their failures and the enemy knows they will use the knowledge to destroy him. These great warriors will not be beguiled by selfish ambition and pride. They have walked through the fire of affliction and shine with the radiance of heaven. Their strength lies not in themselves, but in their love for one another. They esteem their brothers better than themselves. And it says they are fearless because they have suffered all that hell has thrown at them, yet they have endured it. Furthermore, they live not for themselves, but for the kingdom of heaven and the lamb. They are passionately devoted to their king and will give all to build up his kingdom. In one glance, Satan has seen that these that these he had tried to destroy will destroy him. He cannot mm. convince them to hate themselves anymore like he once did because they have received their righteousness through life-giving blood of the Lamb. Satan has nothing left to throw at them because these warriors have become familiar with his ways and will use that knowledge against them. He is terrified. He recognizes that this time his time is close and these whom he has tried to destroy have now been raised up and given a higher level of authority in the spirit because of the abuse they have endured by his own enticement. The enemy has trained them with his own destruction and rejection. He has armed them. Satan knows better than anyone else. As he looks into the endless sea of faces of people, he has tried to devour that as he sought to just dethrone the beloved of the father from their place in his heart. As he saw it with hateful jealousy, the destruction of the people in God's eyes, he has sealed his own fate. The souls Satan yearned to destroy have now become unstoppable warriors. And that's what I and that's what I see every time I see y'all. Man. I see the potential. I don't know how I see it. I just I just always I have. I always have. You so always that's a good thing and a bad thing. <laughs> Hey, hey, since since you wanted to take it there, I wouldn't grab something. <laughs> Twenty years worth. So, I'm I'm definitely gonna give my my flowers uh, to one of the people that that really, really uh, stepped in. Right when I'm giving up drug dealing and, and giving up clubbing and women and, and, and you grabbed me and you didn't let go. This is from this goes this dates back to 2009. But this is something you gave me. And I'm gonna read this. I'm I'm gonna take myself off camera so I can look at this. Get 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 your get your tissue ready so I can read this. I'm gonna read this too. 
It says, "Man, I already got that snot running." <laughs> no, because because I want I want you to have these flowers while it's time. It says January tenth, two thousand and eleven. It says, wow. "Oh yeah, I forgot that day before yesterday. We found out we're having a baby." I said, "I chose to name him Ezekiel, like out of the Bible." Because when I started to change my life, Ezekiel is the prophet I chased after. Mrs. Beth gave me a standard, and I desired to meet it. Ezekiel means God's strength. This will be spoken into his life from day one. Ezekiel 22 and 30 reads, I sought for a strong man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Standing in the gap. I am looking for a man, says the Lord, who will stand in the gap for me. One who will battle the enemy on behalf of the church. One who would dare to, but not to put on the full armor of God, the full battle array, and be all that I require him to be. I require much of this man, more than he could ever hope to be in and of himself. I require him to be holy. I require him to be pure in heart. I require him to be loving and humble and gentle and wise and strong. I require him to be knowledgeable of my word and perfectly obedient to it. I require of him to be a true worshiper. I require him prayer, the kind that ascends to my throne room where I can answer in power and might. I require him perfect obedient to all that I say for him to do. To go where I say go, to do what I say do, and to be what I say be. I require of him faith, the kind that moves mountains. I require of him to lay down his life for others, to prefer others above himself, to give no thought for tomorrow or for his life. I require him to be different, peculiar, elusive, misunderstood, despised by many, hated, persecuted, abused, and amidst it all, I require him to turn the other cheek. I require of him mercy. I require of him power to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to set the captives free. I require him to be perfectly conformed to the image of my son, whose name is above every name in heaven, on earth, and beneath the earth. I require him to be just like Jesus. I not only require all of this from him, but I will also give him the ability to meet the requires, requirements I give him, Jesus. If he will only return to me with his whole heart, abandon everything else in his heart, make Jesus Lord of his life, I will deposit the very life of Jesus in his heart through my Holy Spirit. And then I will have found the man I've been looking for and he will stand in the gap for me. Woo! That's what you gave me years and years and years ago, and that's what I hung on my wall. And we here now. Yeah. Man, I I had two boys. So I'm like, um, it's bad enough I didn't know how to be a mom to this amazing daughter, you know. And really that's what I just had to cling to the garment because I didn't know anything. I know I had great parents. I don't I don't that doesn't mean you know how to be a great parent just because you have great parents. But my parents weren't saved, so they didn't bring us to church. They didn't bring us to, you know, you just had, you know, good, solid foundation, you know. But um, I knew it was different. I just knew it was different because, because I was growing. I knew more was required. And um, I didn't know how to give it to them. I didn't know. I was learning myself. I was like, I'm not even sure I hear from the Lord. But there would be glimpses of confirmation because all, all I needed was, OK, Lord, I found out about Gideon and Gideon put the fleece and then said, Lord, I need the fleece. But not. And, you know, of course, he wakes up and he's like, OK, Lord, I think this is you because I think this, that next time I'm going to need the ground to be wet and the thing to be dry. <laughs> so I know he confirms. So then I had to learn what confirmation looks like, you know, and it'll be something that means nothing else to anybody else. But all of a sudden it's like, Oh, I see mm -hmm. you Lord. And so I knew like there was specific things and it's like, I would see something and I knew I had to give it to you. Like I just knew. And so that's how he guides me. And 
you know, like you said, go, go where he says go. You never know what your obedience means. You never know. Sometimes you'll never know this side of heaven. That mm -mm. somebody's salvation, you the answer to somebody's prayer, they're crying out to the Lord to show up. He's like, well, I'd show up if I could get some, move somebody. You know, it's like <laughs> my people kind of stubborn. Yeah. Well, I didn't want to be like that. I wanted, I wanted to be able to be used because, again, the only thing we can take to heaven with us is other people. Mm. So how, how are we going to do that if we're not loving people? Look, the world's hard enough somebody, without somebody all of that. that. Somebody, t I never heard that. The world's somebody already hard that. enough. The only thing that we can take to heaven with is other, is people. other people. Boy, if we understood that, what would our focus be? Jeez. Somebody so I just um, that, that that one that yeah yeah. I think people raised in church also have just like me. I didn't know anything. I feel that they have to unlearn things that religion has taught them. You know, like we're we're still doing stuff now that the Lord's hand is not upon. Just because we've always done it, don't mean He's still using it. Mm -hmm. We have to be about our Father's business to reach this generation that is so different, so different. Okay, so I was explaining to Brandon that. During COVID, my son, I have another son. I just want to show my picture real quick. So this is my crew. My people. This is, this is little Jared. We talked about little Jared. And then there's Megan, the one that prayed me off the, the bar top. This is Megan H. That's my God-given daughter. And then this is Dylan. That's so mine. Dylan's in the Army. He's in active duty. And then Jared's in the Air Force. And, and Uncle Sam trusts him a whole lot more than I did. He's in charge of <laughs> maintenance on C-17s. Hello. I still don't trust him to do my laundry, but don't tell him that. He you know, hey. If and look, he and good at what he does. Just naturally good. So this is where I'm at right now. This is me with my daughter, her amazing family and kids. And that's a whole nother story about how they couldn't even get pregnant. You know, the Lord for years, a couple of years. And um, after doctors, they finally went to check and they said, um, well, it's not just you. You know, it's not just one of you. You each have a separate issue. So the likelihood of you having children and they were like, well, OK, we got that word. Now, the desire to parent is not going away, even though we're youth pastors. You know, um, something's got to break. Well, that was in, uh, you know, couple years that was about four years of them struggling miscarrying and it was a silent battle so I visited them in Tulsa 2019 and I was following Transformation Church I've been watching Transformation Church online for a couple of years before that and Megan goes hey when you come for Easter that's what I wanted to do at Easter weekend when you come for Easter we'll have our service at our church in the morning but then Transformation has theirs in the afternoon and I'll go with you and um, I was like, oh, that's awesome. I didn't even know transformation was in Tulsa. I just knew it wasn't in Louisiana. So, right. so I came and I said, uh, so during church, I got, I got confirmation. And I went to transformation service that night. Um, and I heard, you know, during worship, it's time to move. And I'm like, like, time to move, you know, because I used to, you know, we used to do that. You know, you don't know nothing about that. So um, I said, Lord, if that's you. If that's you, you're going to have to confirm it three times before I leave this weekend. Mm -hmm. Anybody knows me. I was a bus driver. I put love wins as my hashtag. All the things, a whole testimony about that and how God used those kids to heal me when I had to let my kids go. Because mm. just so you know, your kids don't belong to you. They belong to him. And when he says, let them go, you got to let them go. Mm. That was hard because I got divorced and Dylan was 10. And I had to let him go. And they lived in Texas. And that was a whole nother situation. So, um, so I said, Lord, if that's you. So before that weekend, the first confirmation I got was the next morning. I'm like, Lord, because I'll go. You know, I said, I'll go wherever I go. You know, you say go, I say go. So he, the next day, there's a huge billboard. And it said, spoiler alert, love wins. Mm, got him. And I was like. Got I was him. like, Lord, are you actually going to give me permission to come to Tulsa? They had already gotten the word that it was, each one of them had a problem, an issue. So I said, but Megan, you know, what if he wants you to adopt or foster or something else? And I mean, 
you have a bunch of people in your life that people are like, if something happens to me, you get, I want you to raise my kids. What if something's going to happen to one of them? And all of a sudden you're going to get their kids, whatever, whatever the Lord told me to move. And I don't know about y'all, but I, I don't have no choice but to obey. Cause if I stay somewhere, I'm not supposed to be, there's no grace. So if I got to go or there's no grace or I'm staying in a place where, and that ain't good for nobody. If I'm there with no grace, <laughs> You, you don't want, look, it's hard, it's hard enough to be around me and I'm full of, you know, and the Lord is upon me, you know, so, um, so he confirmed I was to move and I moved by that summer. And by the time I got there, she was pregnant already. And so Brindley was born right before COVID. She was born January, COVID hit March. I'm like, what the hell? Like, what oh, is going on? Doctor, like, is, I know. Look, so, oh, and it's 40 days after the doctor said that. It was 40 days Brady counted until they got a pregnancy. So don't tell me what the Lord won't do. But because he's a youth pastor, I told Brady, I follow prophets and apostles because we're supposed to have those in the church. And if you don't see them in your church, you have to be following. They need to be in your group. You know, you need to understand what the apostles and the prophets are saying for this time or how we know that we're confirming we're hearing from the Lord, you know? And so, um, I believe that whatever he's telling me usually for my immediate family is for the whole body. Mm. And I told Brady, I said, you know, he's moving me here. So y'all are going to get kids some kind of way. I don't, I don't know how, but he wouldn't send me for no other reason, not to just come hang out with y'all. Like there's a reason if Miss Beth gets assigned to you, man, you got something on you. I don't know what it is. You know, I don't know where you're going. I don't know what you did. So, but we can find out. We're going to find out and use it to the fullest. Are you going to have to run with all that you have for the rest of your life to stay away from him? One or the other. Mm -hmm. And we probably won't be friends no more because, you know, when they not with the Lord, they can't even pick up the phone and call, uh, do they? Or text. Look, oh, yeah. You don't know nothing about that, Brandon. You don't know nothing about that. But look, running from the I Lord. Anyway. <laughs> look. Oh, so, yes. uh, so, Brady, we got Brindley right before COVID hit. And, um, you know, it's like, of course, your words turn upside down. Like, this whole story of me coming here as I'm driving my U-Haul truck, and that was hard because I had to do it alone. I was like, Lord, I, I mean, come on now. Like, I don't mind doing it, but I'm like 50 years old. You got me driving this U-Haul. Everything I own fits in a little bitty storage unit. I'm towing my car, but I got to do it by myself. Like, everybody's busy. Nobody could come with me. Whatever. Me and the Lord, story of my life. So I'm driving in. I drove in on a Wednesday, and that Sunday I went to church at Transformation. Literally, Michael Todd's testimony was they bought the building. Crazy Faith started that weekend. I'm like, I've been living crazy faith. I'm, I've been living crazy faith talking about, that, but but if it wasn't for the Lord, <laughs> and it just confirmed in me, I had been hearing crazy faith, and I'm like, yep, that's me. I know they call me crazy. And my aunt actually, which is a whole nother story, the what the Holy Roller, she was murdered that same time. When I started moving here and I was like, Lord, what in the world? Her son, it was national news, had um, hacksawed her head off and all the things. And that's a whole nother story. But I knew she had written a small book and it's called They Called Me Crazy. Mm. And I know that I was prophesied over years ago that I'm going to write a book. Anybody that knows me, I can barely speak English and it's definitely not good I don't speak English well, you or however you want to say it. So he said, you're going to write the rest of crazy. You know, they call me crazy. So whatever that's going to look like, he's going to look crazy, I'm sure. So <laughs> look, you got to. So look, him. so we had, I know, right? So we lived through COVID, you know, well, you know, we still living through COVID and all the adjustments that are going to come. But right after that, some people in Brady's church, um, they just wanted to, so they contacted Baggin and said, look, we want to get Brady, we want to bless Brady with a vehicle because he had a truck. But um, both of their children were volunteers in Brady's youth group. So, mm -hmm. you know, he is, they just, they love Brady and Megan. So he's like, I want to bless Brady. And they would go find these expensive cars for people and people pay lots of money for that. 
he said, you know, what's Brady's idea of vehicle? And Brady was like, a white Raptor was very specific. They found one and they wanted to bless Brady with it. So not only did he get the kid that he always prayed for, um, like two months later, Megan's pregnant. They're like, oh, and we want to present him with a Raptor truck. And I, I, in my gut, I was like, the Lord said, I will give you exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or pray. So we didn't know what it was going to look like because sometimes he doesn't, you know, he wants you to foster because there's a kid out there that needs you specifically because of what's in them to help bring that out. So I just feel, you know, that that's sometimes that and then you get pregnant or what the stories always look different. So I didn't want to assume she was going to get pregnant, but she got pregnant and, um, then Brady gets his Raptor truck, and I'm like, this is an example for Brady. He can believe God for whatever he wants for this generation, mm. and God's going to fulfill it. He's going to chase him. He's got to have the deep faith that God's going to do, but it's going to be outside the box. Because we would have never thought, like, you know. So then a year comes, so 2021, we kept Brindley alive for a year. woo We lived through COVID, all the things. Yeah, well, a month after that, we got another one coming. We got two girls. <laughs> Double for and the before, trunks. Look, God told me that that was the exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask. So literally, we got a one and a three right now. <laughs> and you know, youth pastors, children, they just a handful. <laughs> But I love it because I see in them the creativity that God has put in this generation is unmatched. Mm. It's unmatched. We're not to harness them. We're to help train them to hear, listen, and obey. Hold up. Say so, that again. We are not. Okay. So this generation, we are not to train. You know, normally we're like trying to tame them. Like, no, we don't do that. No, that's not acceptable in the church. Listen. We are not to tell them what God is telling them and not telling them because God is going to tell them things that he ain't telling us. He's telling them we have to listen and get it from them. It's coming from them. We are not to tame it or hinder it or put ceilings over it. We are to help them hear and obey. Because I remember you, when you said you were going to go back in the club and speak, you know, poetry and all that after coming out of the clubs, I did not tell you. There were people telling you God wouldn't tell you to do that. Listen, I'm not going to tell you God didn't tell you to do nothing. You he told some man to build. I, yes. And I said, watch, watch. This is going to be, look, I'm going to be throwing out my church in my voluntary position because I was up in the bar with Brandon, you know. You and Billy and, you know, Listen, look, this is where the people are. But showing up, I knew I didn't have to show up. But by showing up, I knew how powerful that was. And you needed to know that, that it's it's okay. Like, yeah. if you say this is where you're supposed to be, I'm all right with it too. Yeah. Because if you disobey, that's only on you. Yeah. And that's what I told you. I said, I don't know if it's God or not, but if it's not him, you're going alone. Yeah. That's all I told you. If it's yeah. not him... But if it is him, he's got you. Yeah. Don't listen to what anybody else says. Don't listen. Because I don't know what God told you. And glory to God, the whole world just listened after that. <laughs> yeah. And they was like, yeah. what is he doing? He's trying to be in the club and be at the church. And then, yeah, the, the whole world ended up listening. But, but he does that. When you get delivered from something, he will send you back. Mm -hmm. To help, and so I, I don't know where people say, "Well, that wouldn't be the Lord," or "Would Jesus have with sinners?" But we just we forget all that. Like we forget, you know. Anyway, listen, That's, I'm not. You know, hey, that I wasn't was raised in church, so. <laughs> hey, that was powerful. I hope we caught that. That that last you know? statement. We we are not to harness that. We we are to listen to them, and 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 help bring that out of them. I if we it. could help them learn the character of God, because we're not God, and what God is telling me, he's not telling them. He's telling them on a whole nother level. Like they're, I don't want to say that 
junior Bible quiz or JBQ is not, cool, you know, the thing anymore. But there's things we are doing in church that God doesn't have his hand on anymore. Mm. Like it's more of the creative art, the video audio stuff like that. The giftings to go into the digital world, mm. I think, is huge. That's what it is. And we don't need the world running it. We need the church. People full of the church, for the Lord, going into these places and running these companies and all the. It should it should be okay for my kids to get on my grandkids to get on social media and stuff because I know God's people are in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. We can't give everything over to the devil. Come on now. The the last the last thing he spoke to me is I'm gonna give you the blueprint to, to take the airway. Yeah. And it's not like I, I see people doing it all the time. Oh, you need a producer and you need all this and you need all that. And I'm like, I, it's not so. I have one of my bus moms because, you know, when I drove a bus, like that was a whole nother level of ministry. And God used that to heal me from, you know, the separation of my own kids. And I have a bus mom that's really close to me now. And when I went home, she said, you know, you're on assignment. I'm like, girl, I'm always on assignment. And she goes, she said, I've got to spend some time with you just hanging out, laughing with you. She said, um, you know, I just been in a really dark place. And I'm like, cool, let's hang out, all the things. And she said, um, God told me I need to get my house in order and so on and so forth. And she said, I need a full-time position. I said, did God tell you to get a full-time position? No. I'm like, listen, what, what, what? Okay, that's, you're right, you're right. I have to wait. I said, what was the instruction, the last instruction he gave you? To get my house in order. Okay. Mm. She's, work, she's working part-time in a school as an intervention counselor, which is great because it's, um, if you see a student that's slipping before they actually fail, they try to intervene and get them tutoring and so on and so forth. So she's finding out, you know, a lot of these kids, their home life is not good. You know, try to give them some, you know, stabilization or whatever, however she can, whatever the Lord shows her. But Mm -hmm. And then she said, a full-time position came open at such and such and such, such, but it needs a teaching degree. She said, so I'm going to look and see if I can get some of these scholarships. And I'm like, hold up. Did God tell you to go back to school? Because mm -hmm. listen, I know the world says you have to have degrees and you have to have all of that. Pastor Todd says all the time, I got six months of high quality Tulsa Community College under my belt. Mm -hmm. And I do things. You know, it it just wasn't for me. I probably oh, should have a degree, but I don't. But if I am over getting a degree that he didn't tell me to go get, I'm out of order. I'm not aligned. If he tells you to go get the you better go get the degree. <laughs> but if he didn't tell you that, don't do it. I don't care what everybody's telling you. I don't mm -hmm. care what the job requirements are. I don't care. That, it don't matter. Obedience. But when we try to figure it out, we don't have to figure it out. We don't have to try to do nothing. He will literally, bam, bam, bam. I mean, literally. Oh, wait. I showed, I showed y'all the, the church staff picture. This is really what our life looks like every day. This is the real deal. <laughs> the children Look, that's the real deal. Listen, we ain't got no, no shame. This is our game. Look, it is what it is. <laughs> this is our crazy train. Welcome to the crazy train. <laughs> so, so, Mom Beth. If if, yeah. if you can give us anything to to hold on to and take with us, what would you give us? In my darkest hour after I got divorced, I literally, I lost my house. I didn't have a house. We were upside down in our house. My 15 passenger van went back. So I didn't have a car. Didn't have a career because I just spent the last 16 years raising kids doing greeting cards, like working part-time, just doing whatever I had to do. I didn't have a career, didn't have a place to live, didn't have nothing. And I'm like, this is what obedience looked like? Because I literally, me and my husband, we had been bumping heads. We were going in two different directions. When he says a house divided falls, he was not threatening. He's just telling you the consequence of yeah. when you're not on the same page, it's just what happens and just yeah. be prepared. So my husband don't want to surrender and listen to the Lord. And that's fine. I get that, that I get it. I cannot go back to that other 
person, she's a hot mess. She'd be still on the bar trying to get attention from men, gambling addicted, addicted to drugs, been, look, addicted to attention, like all the things. I don't like her. She's empty. She's a hot mess. And I just don't want to be her again. And I told my husband at the time, I'm like, me, without Jesus, you know her and you don't like her. She cheated on you in the beginning of the marriage. I got, thank God for my child. I got saved later. But so I know what I am without Jesus and I don't like her and, and I don't want to go back to her. Mm-hmm. So um, I just know that you had said what one thing, learn to hear and obey. Because his plans that exceedingly abundantly, you have no idea of how great it is. I would have never prayed for this. I'm Christian and look, dream big. I would have never dreamt I could be a part. I live under my son-in-law's roof. And he will tell me in a heartbeat, go sit down somewhere. (laughs) He's okay with me being here because I'm supposed to be here. All I do is solve problems for them. Seriously, I love it. Mm -hmm. I'll come up with an organization. I'll come up with something to help their life go better because they're out there in the trenches showing up because this generation don't want you telling them nothing. If you ain't showing up for their football games, their baseball games, their flute recital, their 4-H club, whatever. So when I got to get in your face, I done already been in the trenches with you. So I have a right to tell you this is the deal. Get yourself right. That's another I mean, that's, big. That's another big one you just said. I hope they, they don't this. want you standing on no stage telling them what to do from your platform. I was in the trenches with you guys, so when you was acting a knothead, I very well didn't have to apologize thirteen times and give you all kind of compliments. I'm like, dude, you've got to get it together. Look, because I love you. Mm-hmm. Gotta show. And the same with my kids. We got a comment from our pops that says, Miss Beth, we thank you. Been there since the <laughs> beginning. We thank you for loving on our young people. Y'all drop some hearts and give Miss Beth some love for her story. Look, hold on. We got another. And look, moms and dads that allow me to come <laughs> and chase their kids with them, it's a privilege. No, seriously. But I know that my kids weren't listening to me. So I'm going to go chase other people's kids and help them because I don't have to. And when people show up and they don't have to show up, it means a lot more. Mm -hmm. It means a whole lot more. Yeah, they're grateful that their dad's there and their mom's there. But when you don't have a a, a horse in the race and you show up and say you are amazing and you are good, it adds on to this foundation that the parents already have given. Yeah. You know, so when you are stuck on stupid and your parents are telling you that and you're not listening, he'll send you another (laughs) He sent you the two by four. And say, that's the, hey, that's didn't the your parents tell effects. you? <laughs> that's the village effects. When it's like it that, takes a you, village. Look, look, they might run out that first la- layer, but they got a they got a wall <laughs> right here. They get past it, they got another yeah. wall right here to keep them back. That's that's the beauty of the village, and we and we gotta understand that, and we gotta be okay with the village. Like it's certain things that Z go through. I know I'm not gonna be able to reach him, but instead of battling. My prayer is, Lord, send somebody that can't touch you. Send somebody, yeah. Yeah, well, and because you want them to have that diversity around them. You don't want them. But listen, it's hard now because then the world, there's so much danger out there. We're wanting to shelter them. Listen, you got to just trust God. You know, That's like it. at the church I was at, there was a kid who was being tormented. And my adopted daughter, Megan, came to me and said, Mom, you have to do something There's a demon that is tormenting this boy, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, listen, all I can do is talk to the parents when they get here to see if we can pray for him. If their parents don't let, we have to just let it go. Well, make a long story short, his mother was the secretary to the pastor and they got wind of, we just wanted to, I didn't say all of that. All I said to her was, hey, do you mind if we want to, we pray over him, you know, so on and so forth. And she's like, oh no, thank you. I appreciate it. You know. Like, like Megan was bothered. She wouldn't even sleep that night. She's like, mom, I'm like, listen, we were willing and available. The parent is the authority. They said, no, we have to be okay sleeping, putting our head down tonight, knowing we tried. Mm -hmm. So she couldn't let it go. And I, and I understood because she felt the torment that the little boy was feeling. 
see you see things that I'm glad I don't see. Mm-hmm. You know, Megan, she feels the character of it. And I'm so glad I don't have that either. So yeah. she felt that for that little boy. And I, and I get it. But you can't overstep the bounds. So we prayed for that. You know, he lost his daddy the next week. His mm. dad was killed in a motorcycle accident. Wow. So, but hey, but but I did, and I have to just like Jesus, dust the dust the yeah. dirt off your feet and move forward, and know it's not personal. God's always looking at a bigger picture. When I went through my divorce, I just wanted to die. I just didn't want. I didn't want to. I can't be worrying about no kingdom. I just, Jesus, I just need you. I just need you because this is too painful. It's too, well, years later, I wish you'd have just told me at the time, no house, no car, no career, all of that. He said, it's because I didn't want nobody to get credit for anything you have but me. Mm. Because nobody, literally nobody could get credit. That's what the Lord got me a vehicle. That's when I connected with Marlies to work at that school. Man, I loved it. I loved it. Mm-hmm. All the cussing kids was there. All the ones that got kicked out of regular school and got kicked out of the alternative. This was the alternative to the alternative. Loved it. Oh my God, I loved it. Was that the YCC? So, that was uh uh-uh, that was um um oh my gosh. It's not YCP, it's the it was the one in Lafayette, uh that Marlise was the director over. I, I, oh my I god, I can't believe about. I wanna say it's job core, but it's not. The job core is here. We got another and company. then when I came here, okay. Oh, we got another comment from my mom. She said, it takes a village. Yes, mom. Yeah. I, hey, look, I welcome the village, uh, you know, with my kids because I knew it, you know, it means more when, and again, that's investing in somebody else's kids, sowing and reaping, you know. We got another comment that says, don't be threatened by the village. But I get it, though. But I, I do get it because you do. Because, you know, the, the creepy, you know, you don't know everybody's motives, but the Lord still, they still belong to him. So anything that happens to them, it's still his responsibility. Look, yeah. we're like losing light out here. Hold on. Um, so I'm going to go turn the light on. But um, literally, there we go. So the years, yeah, it's a privilege. I, I, I didn't chase y'all thinking I knew anything. I chased y'all because. You know, my life was boring and y'all made it so exciting. <laughs> Plus, I didn't want to go to everything by myself. I'm like going to a worship service or going somewhere. I'm like, hey, who wants to go? And if and if it was meant for y'all to go, y'all be available. Look, you know? look, we, we had some trips. <laughs> we had some trips. We had some good trips. thing. They didn't have a lot of cameras back then. Look, <laughs> I need everybody that's on this live right now to share the live. Uh, we got some major, major nuggets. Like they say, you have been pouring into kids for years. <laughs> you, you have been, been helping with, with those who have been chosen by God and, and, and had struggles. You, you grabbed them and you, and you stayed on them and, until they got it together. And uh, 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 it's, it's, it's amazing to look at, though. It's amazing to look at. And, uh, it's humbling because, you know, Glenn... Uh, it- Part of the cadre, we now look back. Oh, Glenn. When you were struggling. Glenn is doing so good. He's intensive. I hear from him maybe once a year. Just a dynamite. Just he's a man now. He's a grown man. Y'all are all grown men now. Ross. It's just Ross. I mean, just doing, just love the Lord all there and just going after him. Just going out. And everybody's walk looks different, you know, but it's the same. Yeah. Go after him. Do Go where he said go. Do what he said do. Say what he said to say. The script. And there's going to be haters. Look, haters hate. Most of the time, that's not about you. That's about them, you know? Mm-hmm. So that, that's what I've learned. When I was going through my divorce, I was in such pain. I couldn't see the bigger picture. And I knew that God allowed things. But I'm like, oh, so, okay. So obedience looks like you lose your house. You lose your car. You, lose, you don't know what you're doing tomorrow. You don't know what you're going to eat tomorrow. You don't know. This is what obedience looks like. And then Job came into my mind. I'm like. Yeah, we all went double for the trouble, but nobody wants to try. <laughs> when the nobody trouble is trouble, it's trouble. Look, it was painful. Like, I wanted to die. I wanted to go back to doing drugs, but I don't like her, the person I... 
So then I was like, my kids don't deserve that. They've been through enough. And so I just had to keep it together. And I'm like, any place that was playing worship music, anybody that was having a service, I would get on Facebook and I'd go to work at the school. And that's draining because I'm going through this divorce. And listen, they poke, they get in your face, talk about, because I was just a janitor. Literally, I was just a janitor. And they would have to do, um, if they got in trouble, they would have to stay after school. Yeah. And um, so when they'd stay after school with me, we would watch movies like Coach Carter and then talk about it and talk about why, what, who are some of the people that you look up to and why and all the things. Mm -hmm. God would just give me things. And it's like, meet them right where they're at. And I just speak life into them and we'd look up what their name means and we, you know, that kind of thing. Because yeah. if I had one day with them or if I had two hours with them, I just wanted it to count. I just wanted God to leave a little mark, just whatever time we had. There's, they still follow me on Facebook, some of them, and it's been years, years. Mm -hmm. And, and look, um, that's all I want to do. And look, my prayer is that every seed that you have sown throughout all the years be re returned to you a hundredfold in any way possible. That's that's my prayer. That. that we will we will see it on this side. All of those yeah, things that you have sown return to you. Well, I'm looking at all of y'all's lives and just humbled. You know, I'm just grateful that y'all still look answer my text messages every now and then. <laughs> I'm like, because you know, I got a young man that's in Beaumont Federal Prison, a young guy that was a job corps here and just during COVID saw his family struggling. He was working like he was supposed to but not making a lot of money. Yeah. He just was tired of everybody suffering around him. So, you know, he held up a dollar general, just stupid. Just, just not thinking. He said, well, the, the store will get their money back The you know, nobody's going to get hurt. Like, so he thought it out as far as he could for being 19, but he got a federal charge because it was the national chain and he did it right before closing. So he, there was no customers there. Bless his heart. The cops were standing outside the front door. Clink, clink. You, you know, Anyway, this young man, I have been walking with him for several years. And he's like, Beth, there's no reason for you to still keep be in touch with me. I'm like, listen, 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 listen. You don't know who you are. God has a calling. And I used to tell him in the hallways in the mornings, getting dressed for job corps. I was the I was the resident advisor. I was a mother, is what I was doing. Like, get up. You've got three minutes to get to breakfast, <laughs> make your bed, because then I had to do the inspections. And, uh, you know, and they'd be like, why are you always on me about my bed and about my, I said, because it's about taking care of what you have before you can have more and all the things. And I would tell him, you don't see what's in you do when you were dealing drugs, people were following you when you were doing all their fault. They're going to follow you wherever you go. You're a leader. You're a natural leader, mm -hmm. which is why I'm here. <laughs> yeah. And he was just yeah. like, he would get so irritated with me. But now he's like, Miss Beth, I'm so glad that you just are still here. He said, because I, he said, I don't know what I would do. So when I reached out to you, I was like, he should be getting out in a couple of years. And it's like his whole mindset is different. He's listening yeah. to the Lord's teaching him and showing him who he is and what he's got planned for him, not losing his mind. I said, keep your mind right. Keep your mind right. Chin up, mind right. The Lord's going to keep you. And he said, I can't wait to take you to the schools to go talk again when I get out and tell my story and tell yeah. those young people. And I'm like, yeah, because you're going to be cool. I'm not. I'm old now. I'm like retirement. age. <laughs> They're going to be like, oh, you know, old lady with gray, gray hair. What's she going to tell me? Look, Same thing I told him. Look, I'm like, I told him. I said, look, we would be in thing. I'd be talking to him down the hallway. And I'm like, hey, don't you let this bun fool you. You got to get over here and do what I asked you to. <laughs> you know, because I'm all a 5'2", and he was like 6'2", and he'd be like, why are you always on me? And I said, because you need to take more responsibility for your stuff. That's why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he would get so irritated with me. But yeah, Look. I'm okay with going in the enemy campground. I'm all right with it. I'm like, let's go. Let's go get them. Look, and, and, <laughs> and like I said, don't stop it. Do not give up on this journey. You You already know you got stuff to do I don't even have to explain none of this. Whew. I don't have to explain none of it, man. Just keep on. And it's been a crazy story how he's just, you know, you think you need a job with 401k and all the medical benefits. Yeah, that looks great on paper. If he tells me to get a job that has benefits, well, if I don't have medical benefits, I guess you're going to have to be a healer. 
if I don't have a job that pays a lot of money, I guess you're gonna have to be a provider. I'm just gonna hold you to be all the things that you said you were. So that's another level of faith when you don't have the the world systems to back you up. You don't have the, you know, food stamp. I mean, we need. I'm not saying we can't use the systems. I'm just saying when the Lord calls you to have faith to let go and walk out on the water, just do it. Because hey, you, you will never know. You You'll never see know. A whole nother side of him, though. A whole nother Just remember, side. I'm the one who's being drugged by the hem of his garment. <laughs> That's me hanging from the garment. Well, look, Mom yeah, Beth. It's been a fun ride. I love you. Look, we shut it down. We're going to go out with a song. <laughs> I thank you for your story. And look, Mwah. look, we got some nuggets tonight. <laughs> We got some nuggets tonight. I hope so. And look, continue to race. Continue pouring into every person's life that's connected to you. And we love you. And we appreciate you. And we thank you. I love you guys. All right. Thank you, guys. And thank you for all those guys that walk with you all the years. I see I see your village. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love watching you grow. It's funny how it's I know. Funny. Yeah. Look, I look at Zeke and I'm like, oh my goodness. Oh, oh my. I know. Hey, I just can't. The, the beauty, the beauty about it is I, I know the calling and I know what I'm dealing with and I know how to rock with it. I know how to rock with it's it. All, he has so much to bring to the table. Oh, real quick, I was gonna tell everybody we were talking earlier. So God gave me this idea, like this framework of what this generation is. Okay, so this generation, our generation, our parents could get in our face and you know. We would line up and we got grit and all of that. And we did the hard work, you know. Well, this generation, they're not used to that. If you get in their face, they're like fainting goats. It's like, you want to get in their face and try to say, you, you, you. And they, they like faint. It's like, <laughs> it's like uh, they just get so wrapped up in their emotions. It's like they have no, like, grit. There's no um, long suffering anymore. There's no... You know, so it's a different generation. So to get out of them what we need without them fainting, like they can't hear, you know, they just all of a sudden they just pass out and they don't hear nothing we have to say. We have to listen to the Lord on how to reach him or we're not going to get what he's put in them. We're going to mm. lose out. We're literally going to lose out. Mm -hmm. So the programs that God don't have his hand on anymore, things that you're trying to keep afloat and the Lord's hand ain't on, just let it go. Just let it go. Let him Put your hand on what he's doing because that's what's important. That's the only way we're going to reach him. It's the only way. It's tight, but it's right. <laughs> Look, all the thank you generation. I roll up on some kids and they're like, I'm like, oh. Look, that, that you approach ain't going to work. That approach is not nope. going to work with these ones. And like so it's said, up to us to change. We got to do the transforming to be able to be used. We're the vessel of Jesus. He's in us, but if we don't conform to what he's needing it to pour out onto this next generation, they just going to miss out. Look, We're going to miss out. They're going to miss out. Look, that old wineskin, it ain't, it ain't <laughs> happening. It no ain't more. happening. Yep. You could, look, you could keep trying to hit it's that not always comfortable. Wall. I always get tired after a while, and and then yeah. what I'm noticing, like, it's forcing us to change, and we don't yeah. like that. We yeah, we don't think we arrived do, at do something. They say. need to come, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. they gonna work. The Lord, yeah, I, the Lord's dealing with all of us. You know, and it, look, it's orchestrated. Look, it's forcing us to heal to be able to <laughs> help them. It's true. Yep, because all that'll be exposed. <laughs> All that, just like working with those kids that are broken. Boy, they stick their finger in every insecurity. I had one of them little girls talking about, well, you just a janitor. That's why your husband divorced you anyway. Oh, they hit all the buttons. And I'm like, oh, oh, I can't stand. And the Lord would just, he'd heal it. You know, it, look, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's almost but like, look, they, now, they, hey, it's almost like they said to be a reflection to us. Right. It's true because you know what? Now I lost my kids. I lost. I lost everything. There ain't nothing the devil could take. Look, I ain't never had no money. I don't. What you gonna take from me? What? What you gonna take from me? I done lost it all, so I ain't got nothing to lose at this point. Which is what I told them kids at job for. I'm like, listen, you don't know. I ain't got nothing to lose at this point. Mm hmm. 
So I'm going to run with your hair fall. We got to run. Let's do this. <laughs> but yeah, once, once the enemy doesn't have anything he can poke at and use, and he hates that. He That's hates when you're that. ready. That's yep. when you're ready. Oh, and this is the other thing. So I, this is the whole gospel. Like uh, the young guy, Trenton, that I was talking about, he, um, he's like, Miss Beth, like, I don't understand the Bible. I said, listen, this is what the Bible is. The God, God took his favorite people out of bondage, took them to, it was a four day trip. It took him 40 years because he was trying to get, he took them out of Egypt, but then he had to get Egypt out of them. Mm. So the process is not about us being in bondage. It's about undoing the damage of the bondage, the trauma, mm. everything that we've, as he conforms us, because where he's taken us, when they start poking their finger in all of our insecurities, like they, he, they will, and things move in us. Okay, so I think the promised land is a mindset. Well, Revelation said this place is going to be hell in a handbasket. So we know that the promised land is not a location. Yeah, It's not a location. I think it's a mindset. It's the mindset of when you have everything healed in you, the enemy can't stick his finger in nothing. I know who my provider is. Even if this job shuts me down like they did, woman fired me. I told her, I said, I'll be your worst nightmare. If you're not, if I'm not here for the kids, you're going to hate me. And she sure did because she was there about numbers. And, um, but I, it didn't matter. I'm fired. Okay. I cried a tear. I shed a tear because I was going to miss the kids. And the kids are like, no, Miss Beth, you can't go. You know, mm -hmm. but that's what it boils down to. Promised land is a mindset to where nothing in us moves. The only thing that moves us is the Lord. The only thing he's moved by is faith. So healing. It's that simple. That simple. So healing. I don't have no scripture on that. That's just my <laughs> look synopsis of it. I definitely feel that. That's a that's a high level of understanding. That's what look. <laughs> we gonna it? say we gonna say or did he just bring it that simple to me because <laughs> Because you got to remember, stuff a little more simple to me. You got to remember, everything that we see here is a result of here. Yeah. So you yeah. can't see a promised land here until you see yeah. it. Period. So, yeah. yeah. we closing on that note, Mom. I love you. We got to let the people go. And look. Love you. Good night, everybody. Look, I will be in touch soon, man. You know how that goes. <laughs> yes, I can't wait. Love you. Ah. Love, you. love you too. Y'all, we're going to rock it out with one more. Look, a little bit more. I love y'all. Hope y'all had a wonderful Resurrection Day. Look, like and share the, the stream. I enjoyed y'all. I enjoyed the comments. And I'm going to enjoy some more time with the wifey. Let's rock this out. To my queens, I see y'all in a different way. It's more to y'all than posing. Posting pictures on your Facebook page. God giving power to uplift a man and make a slave. Speak life into our dreams. Our tears down and watch us fade away. Know your position. Cause you're vital to the family structure. No replacing any mother. Careful how you treat your love. Elegant, heaven sent etiquette is like no other. Her love is better than butter biscuits right out the oven. Know who you are, don't let this world define you. Safe or mold you, God's daughter, queen of nations. There's no box to ever hold you. Life creator, who protect the heaven sent. Love injector, backbone, best gift ever. Worth more than hidden treasure. I speak life, cause this world is trying to turn you cold. Replace that all the stone with flesh. We need your love to make us whole. Take back your crown and hold us down. Together, we won't fold. Get back to love how God intended. Change to make this family. Feel it all this life is tough. Since you gotta 